Great to meet everybody. Uh, I used to be coming to Toronto Jug some time ago <coughs> and I really loved it and I'm super happy to present to you today. Uh, one warning, I haven't done public speaking since before COVID so I'm definitely rusty, a little bit nervous. I also had a business trip this week and I'm coming here right from the airport. So I'm a little bit tired as well, which is good because I don't feel my nervousness. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Yaroslav Novitsky. It's probably a little bit harder for everybody except my Ukrainian friends here. So if you wanted to contact me somewhere on LinkedIn or I don't know, somewhere, you can probably screenshot and search for me. I am working as a software architect in a company called Mission Lane. It's a US uh, fintech startup. Uh, pretty cool company, I love it. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, Kotlin. Uh, Kotlin is our main language, but because I'm an architect, so I'm working a little bit with concepts as well, and I'm going to speak about this exactly one semantics, which is going to boil down to idempotency and things like that. Okay. Let's get started. So I basically talked to Jonathan last year and we're having beers during the conference that we had, like a spring one, right? And uh, I told that I was doing a pretty interesting load test, which I was at first astonished about. Uh, so I was just like, a, let's imagine a, like a plain REST API service and I emitted, let's say, 10,000 requests on it. And I got that 8,000 requests were okay. So basically, this was 200, right? Um, cool. This is what I saw on my screen where I ran my load test. And then I went to the database uh, because the survey saves up something in the database. And uh, like, what is going on here? So I did select count and I'm seeing like on the client side, I'm seeing it's 8,000 successful requests. In the database, I see more than that. So I need to dig in and understand what was really going on there, right? I would like to understand that. So 800, OK, which means 10 minus 8 is, two th uh, sorry, not 100,000. So 2,000, what are they? So they either failed or unknown. And for like number simplicity, I put 1,000, let's say, were 500 requests, which has been failed. And another 1,000 were <coughs> either error, errors on the network level or timing out. So they were basically unknown. So this kind of explains what happened there, because some of the timed out <coughs> requests were actually accounted for on the server side, while the other part of them were not. The client side is not aware about the result. And this is the essence of the problem, what, what I'm trying to speak about. And, uh, and this, this essen essential problem is what's hopefully solved by what is proposed by later on by item, item potency and so on. So. Let's take a look at this. Um, when there is a user, a UI, a backend, and maybe some upstream services for that app, uh, for that backend, and all chain of calls constitute uh, like a state. First of all, in the in the mind of the of the user, how the user sees what's going on in the system, it's what's presented to them in the UI. And I believe that we've basically heard many times like what makes a user happy. It's a prompt response. So basically you click a button and you see that something happened. So you see what's going on. But it's not only that. You also pretty much if you have a prompt but wrong response, which is not correct, doesn't represent the state of the systems behind the scene. It doesn't help to be fast. It needs to be correct as well. And. Uh, so basically, if you can imagine like really old internet times when you had dial-up modems and stuff like that, and you had those, uh, 
PHB, how, how they were called, PHPBB boards, right? And clients without JavaScript. So you basically, you, you click the button and your network connection was bad. And you wrote a really long comment that you wanted to post there. And you don't know whether it's posted or not because your page does not refresh well. So then, like, I, I think people that remember those times of internet, they know what I'm talking about. Like, and this is the desynchronization between the layers that we see on the screen. So the guy on the left, in his mind, he doesn't know whether he's, what's he, what he's written, whether it's reflected in the database on the right-hand side or not. So a person might click button twice and receive two posts, or they wouldn't know whether it was recorded on the back end at all or not. So the consistency, like the consistency of the state and uh, its representation to the end user is very essential for systems to have this not only prompt feedback, but al also correct feedback. Let's simplify this picture to even simpler one, where we have only two components interacting. So basically, let's say we have a UI <coughs> and we have a service. And that's basically the setup I was talking about when I ran the load test. So basically, there is a client side that was emitting API, REST API request to the backend service. And there was a state on the client side which said, said that uh, 8,000 requests were successful and 2,000 failed. And there was a state on the server side which was different and the client was not aware. So if me as the user, this red guy on the left-hand side is, is looking at the screen, I'm pretty much confused because I don't see correct information in my UI. So this, this table here, um, again, maybe dumbing it down even one level more, like a combination of what could go right or wrong when you do a REST API call. You post a comment, the client receives 200, which means the client knows that service has the comment saved in the database because there was like, we purposely choose uh, HTTP because HTTP is an online call. So basically you ask for something, you get a response right when you are asking for it, unless network failed. But if you do get the response, and if the response is 200, you can be sure that the comment was posted on the PHPBB site or whatever. So it's a known state, it's successful, it's known to the client. Let's say you did a post and you got 400 to, as a response, <coughs> then again, you got the response, you know that something went wrong, basically your request was bad because it's 400, right? But you can be sure from the client perspective that the service has no comment there. Another thing, you got a 500 response. Pretty much always, like there are some asterisk marks there because the, 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 there might be some specifics to, to implementation of the service on the back end, but you're pretty sure that there was an error. You got the response, and, but there is no state change on the server side. The trick is the last one when you didn't get the response because of timeout or network error, so the state is undefined for the client. It might have been on the server side, it might not be on the server side. The next one, yeah, here. Yeah, I believe that these are the things that we can do, like, in general. What, what, what we can do when we know that uh, service call service interaction failed. Like one of the easiest options is potentially we could ignore. Maybe there is something not, not really important going on here and we don't care too much. Um, if not, then we probably want to remedy the situation. How could we remedy the situation? We could potentially do a whole cycle of let's ask the server what have you got. Like, did you got what I just posted or not? And based on that, I can do a retry. So basically, I could like redo the same call that I just did, or 
if I see that, okay, you already got what I requested before, then I don't do anything. But this is a whole another cycle of interaction between client and server. And let's say the network m problems, they, they are al also there and uh, this cycle could fail as well. Another thing that we could do is we, we, could, we, we didn't have to necessarily ask the server state but we could just retry the operation when we are uncertain of the result, but under one condition, when the operation that we are calling is idempotent. So now I'm trying to do a hand raising exercise. Who knows what is idempotence? Can you please raise the hand? Who knows what is idempotence? Can you please raise the hand? <laughs> so, you didn't behave strictly as I expected because I expected you guys to have some of you at least to have two hands raised because the nature like the technicality of the question is that who knows please do raise right so idempotence is a property of an operation well Wikipedia says that it's in mathematics or in computer science but I believe it can be expanded more uh, whereby they can be applied multiple times without the change of the result. So when I ask you to raise the hand if, I, if you know what idempotence is, you raise the hand. If I ask you again, you raise the hand again, because this is the technicality of the question. Like if I ask you to have your hand raised if you know, like one hand is enough, right? But it will, it will be a different result, left hand and right hand. Yeah. Well, a hand. <laughs> 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 uh, another example that I like, like why I don't think it's only in mathematics and computer science, it's like if you ask somebody to open a window, like a person would analyze the context beca because we are humans, not computers, and you wouldn't go to the window and open it up if it's already open. Like, um, what was the other example that I had there? Ah, okay, yeah. So back on the previous slide when I said like, is it important to retry or not? Um, or we could maybe like ignore the error. But what, we, what if we are talking here about some financial services? So money movement payments, right? And if I'd ask Jonathan like, hey, can you give me $20? And hey, can you give me $20 again and again and again? Uh, after third time, you probably think that like <laughs> something sketchy is going on here. Uh, but let's say if I told you like give me twenty dollars for pizza that I don't know that that, that uh, let's say we bought last week when we spent some time, you'd know the context that would make the operation of giving me twenty dollars idempotent within that context. So basically, now I think that some operations are intuitively idempotent, but many, even if they are not intuitively idempotent, can be converted to operations, that like this metaphorical f of x can be converted to f of idempotency context plus x. Like if you can form that idempotency context in the correct way, then your function becomes idempotent of those two arguments. Basically that, like, for the pizza last week becomes the idempotency context here. Or what else? Like, ah, okay, and posting the comments, right? If I, if I created a comment that I wanted to post online and like the text of the content of the comment is the same, that is the idempotency context of that function, right? So I want to, I, I basically, I'm not asking like to post the comment on the internet. I'm saying that I want this comment, this text, to be the content of the post, which, like, which I say it multiple times, doesn't change the outcome. Yeah. So sometimes this idempotency context can be deduced from from the business context of the call. Like for example, the posting a comment would be the text of the comment, 
or some hash function of the text of the comment. Uh, sometimes something else. Sometimes it could be done on the server side. Sometimes the client would have more context. And therefore, the client could pass some kind of idempotency key that defines the, con the idempotency context of the operation. And in reality, it is many times the case when the client actually has more context. Even think about this situation when there is a human operator in uh, working with the UI that has a backend. And now you don't have a proper feedback on your screen. And then the human operator understands, OK, maybe there is a ma network delay or something like that. Should I really press this button second time? So this is the idempotency decision that the human operator does at that point in time. Technology can definitely help more there. And uh, like one of the ways is that the UI could pass idempotency key into the service. And service, if it was implemented in the way to recognize that this is an idempotent uh, operation in this context, I should not redo it. So now, for such idempotent microservices, idempotent operations on these REST API endpoints, it becomes a very important part of the contract. Because it's very important, but not enough to say, hey, pass me the idempotency key. Uh, you, can, you can say that. You can say, like, pass me the idempotency key in a header, and that would, would what would define whether this is an idempotent operation in this context or not. Uh, but the contract can go m more than that. Like, f for example, <coughs> the service could deduce the item idempotency context from the content that was, like, part the arguments of the operation that was passed to, to, to that API call. And uh, also the contract in the API around what constitutes a final response and what should be retried. So whenever you maybe read uh, uh, about these kind of things, it's like what are retriable errors and what are not retriable errors. And uh, in here, like if the, if the operation is important, it's not a problem to retry it multiple times even if you did it for the, with the error that was not supposed to be retried because you, you really get the same response, same error. But it's the, it's the contract of where the client is supposed to stop doing that. Uh, because you, you probably don't want to do something forever just, just to retry and not to get a, like an, a next level of outcome rather than the error. So generally speaking, like timeout and network errors should always be retried. 500 errors. Like now, this, like that, that was the asterisk mark in that table. Like sometimes they should be retried because they say that the server side didn't work out, something didn't work out for it. So it's a fault on a server, we'll retry. Maybe the server was overloaded, maybe the server was like in some maintenance mode or something like that. We'll retry. 400s you don't retry because it generally means that the error was on the client side and you should. Re redo, like fix some error in, in your request rather than just retry with the same thing. And like sometimes it's also important to indicate to the client that they are receiving the response of the operation that like now that if you, if you retry an operation but you really get uh, what was applied some time ago you might really want to get uh, to be aware of that because in some high load systems some high load situations like time windows shift conditions shift and you need to be aware like this was applied but back then even if it was like a second ago so to resummarize introducing either potency to api requires you to think about the contract and document it really well this is a kind of a high level, but 
pretty normal logical diagram of how you could apply idempotency to an existing service. So basically the box on the left is the client doing a call and imagine like, an, like a microservice uh, API endpoint without idempotency check would just call into that usual logic that I have on the right hand side, right? And the usual logic would do its stuff and return to the client. Here we are building in a layer which like the first step would be either to get or calculate idempotency key from the request from the client, then look it up in the idempotency store. So you basically read if you have the, <coughs> if you have a record in idempotency store by this idempotency key, uh, this means that this operation was already executed. And in that store, you would have the response of that operation. So you basically could respond to the client, hey, this is already done, I will just, send you the same response that I potentially s already sent you before. I might also indicate like when it was executed as well, but I am not going to do anything else because that potentially changes the state twice and that's what we are trying to avoid. And uh, yeah, if, if the key is not in the idempotency store, then you run the usual logic, but you also intercept the, re the result returned to the client and you store it into the idempotency store. D like uh, it's logical there are uh, there are specifics of implementation depending on what kind of idempotency store database you would like to use there uh, you probably want transactional consistency if your service has a database store in its like usual logic then you want to have potentially want to have transactional consistency between the two uh, if your usual logic calls out to other services, if it calls one to one ser calls out to one service, uh, that is an easier situation. If it calls out to two services, then the situation becomes much more complex. We cannot dive into the, these parts in this presentation. Uh, so, so basically, what I wanted to focus in this presentation is that this is a building block. Like once you have idempotent microservices, you are free to, to use them in different combinations, relying on idempotence, which allows you to retry and eventually bring whatever the client, like le the left-hand side, to the consistent understanding of what's on the, on, uh, on what's on the right-hand side. So basically have a consistent view on the system state. So what I just described, what we talked about was this synchronous interaction via REST API. But once you have idempotent microservices, you can also use them as a building blocks in a, syn a synchronous uh, communication between the microservices. Um, again, there are, th there are details to that, but generally speaking, if, if you send your commands as messages, or API requests as, as messages uh, over a synchronous channel and the service is pulling them. And <coughs> if it happens so that you have this command twice, you'd be able to distinguish and not redo the command because you, you'd get the idempotence key from your, uh, from your message from message queue, which would prevent you to, to do it multiple times. Why it's important for for asynchronous communication? Because in modern distributed systems um, like Google PubSub and other uh, high scale uh, message delivery systems, they many times have um, uh, at least once delivery, which means that they are uh, that they take a promise to deliver the message to you once, but it might be the case that they will deliver to you twice. And again, if it's a sensitive API, twice or more, I mean, if it's a sensitive API that's moving money, that's not what you want to do. You don't want to move money twice or more times. Um, so having these idempotence microservices is important for this situation because then you can use them as building blocks. 
So a little bit more maybe <coughs> pitfalls um, that, that I discovered. Um, so in HTTP and REST is built on HTTP, there is some implied antipotency on methods and generally speaking HTTP says that get, head, put, delete are idempotent methods and post and patch are not. Uh, why I put it under the pitfalls category? Because when you are working with some other <coughs> microservices that implement REST APIs, sometimes you really need to read into specification and or core contract and test them because it might not always be followed. And you might, like, I have really crazy examples. Uh, one big financial institution implements idempotency in the way when, basically, I don't know how, 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 how they justify that, but if you do a post of operation with idempotency key, they would basically open a window, and then you ask to open the window again, and they would close the window. <laughs> um, maybe there is some logic in there for, for their use cases. Uh, I don't see logic there, uh, but beware of those kind of things. And also beware of um, that, that some parts of infra modern infrastructure, like in Kubernetes and stuff like that, um, like service meshes uh, might imply that if there is rest and there is uh, like uh, one of these HTTP verbs that are supposed to be idempotent, they might retry operations behind the scenes and you wouldn't even be aware that that's happening. So I, I've seen that and that's tricky part to, uh, to debug and find what's going on. Um, so yeah. And yeah, as I mentioned, like some especially old APIs when, when people took legacy code and then wrap it up and create RESTful microservices, they are not necessarily uh, co like do comply with this implied and item potency. Um, there are also these cache control headers and many times they are confused or like not necessarily confused by the clients, but they get in the way of uh, proper um, propagation of requests, especially if you have layers of routing uh, in between your client and the service. So cache control could be respected and your call, let's say, doesn't reach even the service. So watch out for that as well. And one of the s like implementation issues is scalability. Because if you're working with idempotent services, if you're creating idempotent services, and you want to create high load systems that uh, process a lot of requests, um, you want to have your, you, re you really need to have your idempotent store um, d distributed between them. So it's basically pretty much a, l a distributed lock between multiple instances of your services which may become a problem uh, because of scalability. One of interesting solutions uh, that I, I, I was using uh, is use of ULIDs. Um, ULIDs is similar to GUIDs. It has interesting uh, specific, it, like by specification, part of the ULID is the timestamp. So basically, when you get a ULID as ID, so for example, using ULIDs in ID as idempotency, idempotency keys. So when, when you take that idempotency key in that layer that um, implements idem, idempotent logic, you can take the part of the ULID that is the timestamp and actually put in your contract that I will support idempotency only like let's say for a few days. So basically if I see if I see a impotency key that is two days old, I will satisfy it. If I see that it's older, I potentially by contract I would not uh, I, I would throw 404 some kind of 400 error because 
the ULIT by contract, I don't want to support this, this, this old idempotency, right? And that gives me the possibility to uh, not to keep all the history of idempotency keys in that database that would be under high load in, in high load systems because they are distributed. So I guess that's basically it. And this is the last slide that I just put <coughs> together because I forgot about it. Um, but yeah, please, questions and answers.